Here are a few other earthquake related topics. When there's a substantial earthquake, we are going to experience what's called an aftershock. An aftershock essentially is just a resettling of the crust. For example, when San Andreas goes, if it's an 8.3 and it rolls along for three minutes, that is so much violence happening in the crust that it will take years for the crust to settle down. That means that, of course, after a violent earthquake like that, within a day or two, we're going to have some other very large earthquakes that are aftershocks. But 20 years later, we're probably still going to be getting aftershocks from San Andreas because of so much violence. One of the things that's studied in an attempt to predict earthquakes, we call foreshocks. These are earthquakes that precede a major earthquake and happen along the same fault system. That means they're related to the major earthquake. The problem with this is that we usually see the foreshocks after the major earthquake. So looking back in time, seismologists look and say, oh, well, this was related and that was related and that was related. But by understanding foreshocks, there is the possibility in the future of being able to be better at predicting when an earthquake is going to happen, at least within a window of when it's going to happen. In some areas on the planet, an event called liquefaction can occur. This is the apparent liquefaction of the ground due to the intense shaking of a strong earthquake. It occurs in unconsolidated, saturated, or nearly saturated material. So unconsolidated material means it's not solid rock. And in fact, in the Los Angeles Basin, there are areas where there's almost 4,000 feet of unconsolidated material, gravel, rocks, sand, below the surface of the planet, before you hit solid rock. And saturated or nearly saturated means there's a lot of water in it. And in fact, in Southern California, in most places, there's quite a lot of groundwater below the surface. And it's not very deep. In the case of places like Costa Mesa, there's almost 4,000 feet of groundwater below your feet. What happens during an intense earthquake is all of those individual particles of the unconsolidated material get hyper lubricated because of the shaking by the water. And in a way, it turns the ground into something like quicksand. The problem with that, of course, is that if there's a building on something like quicksand, it's going to collapse. In this map you see on the right hand side, all of that area highlighted in green is subject to liquefaction. You can see. Irvine, Fountain Valley, Garden Grove, parts of Orange and Santa Ana, Anaheim, Downey, El Monte, parts of Long Beach, all of these areas during San Andreas are going to be subject to liquefaction. That doesn't mean it's all going to go that way, but parts of it probably will. And then if you live along the coastline, as California has a coastline, you can also get hit by tsunamis. Now, Prior to 2004, most people referred to these things as tidal waves incorrectly, but since 2004 with the Indonesian tsunami, we now refer to it by the correct name, which is a Japanese word. I think it means something like wave in the harbor. And a tsunami is a seismic sea wave. They're generated by earthquake or volcanic activity in or around the ocean basin. So if there's a fault line out of the ocean, and it shifts and one block moves up and the other block moves down, that's going to displace the water because water is a fluid. And then that displaced water will move outwards in waves. A little bit like, this is not perfect, but a little bit like if you had a swimming pool and you threw a rock into the middle of the swimming pool, you'll see the waves radiate outwards away from the rock. This is something like what happens with the tsunami. Generally, tsunamis are not very big. However, occasionally they do get very big. The one in Indonesia in 2004 was something in the neighborhood of 30 feet. The one in Japan in 2011 was also 30 feet. 
I believe the tsunami that was generated from Krakatoa in the 1880s in Indonesia that hit Java and Sumatra was more than 100 feet high. This is from the pier in Seal Beach, California. Since the 2004 and 2011 tsunamis, what's happened is along the coast in California, they put up these tsunami evacuation routes, especially in beach communities. What would happen is a horn would blow and then you'd know to get inland rapidly. If you take a look at this, you can see that much of Seal Beach would be inundated during a major tsunami. And in fact, much of the coastal area of Long Beach would also be inundated. Ballast Point, Naples Island, the peninsula where the two guys in Sublime live, all of that area would be inundated by a tsunami. Of course, because Japan is a technologically advanced society, there were lots of photographs and video taken of the tsunamis in 2011. You could see, look at how horrendous this is. If you don't move rapidly, you're not going to get out of the way of this. Look at the building to the left. It's literally being inundated by the tsunami. And that's the same city to the right. It's being completely drowned by the tsunami. This is the aftermath of the Indonesian tsunami in 2004 in Banda Aceh. 